All right, I want to talk to you for a moment about retaining and developing your workforce. It's hard. Recruiting is hard. Retaining top employees is hard. Then you've got onboarding, payroll, benefits, time and labor management. You need to take care of your workforce, and you can only do this successfully if you commit to transforming your employee experience. This is where ISOF comes in. They empower you to be successful. We've seen it with a number of companies that we've worked with, and this is why we partner with them here at WorkDefined. We trust them, and you should too. Check them out at isolvedhcm.com. Oh my goodness. Bad touching, harassment, sex, violence, fraud, threats, all things that could have been avoided if you had FAMA. Stop hiring dangerous people. FAMA.io Hey, this is William Tincup and Ryan Leary. You are listening, hopefully watching, Inside the C-Suite podcast. We're lucky to have Mike Marini on from Plan Source on the uh, show today. And we're going to be talking about his career journey, uh, some of the things that he's learned along the way, et cetera. So, Mike, would you do us a favor and introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, guys. Really do appreciate it. Uh, folks, I'm Mike Marini. I'm was just named the CEO of Plan Source out of Atlanta, Florida, where we do uh, Ben Ad benefits administration. Just coming off of uh, about an eight and a half year career at Workforce Software, where I moved uh, to the board 1231 and retired for five months and 24 days before the guys got talked me into coming back <laughs> to build another team. And today is an exciting day because it was announced today that ADP bought ADP. Workforce. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Uh, that's part of the discussions that I started when I transitioned to the board and, and my number two guy, Jeff Moses, took over. So a nice win for us and for the team at Workforce and for ADP. And Really excited about my uh, new gig at, at Plan Source and the team at Vista that owns it and the team that I inherited there. Good folks. Yeah, and, uh, that's a well, great ad for ADP. That's an excellent mm -hmm. ad to what they do. Perfect yeah. ad. Yeah, yeah it really, it's a good fit and a good fit for workforce for the team there. Yeah. The domain experts, everybody gets to go in, everybody they've got wins. jobs, and they get a bigger footprint and more access to accounts, which is really exciting for the team. Love now, it. First off, Mike, congratulations on that wonderful win there. And but the, the real question behind this is five months and how, how long? How long was your retirement? Five months and 24 days. Hey. <laughs> See, we, we always talk, we joke about, no, we'll never retire. We can't. My father-in-law did this. He retired from, from one dental school, went to the next. I'm like, you retire, retire. W what happened here? Well, what I like to tell people is I was a battered husband. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, I, I got a lot of gas in the tank. I was looking at some yeah. private equity opportunities to sit on the board. Uh, we were renovating a home, doing a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. I got my golf index back down into the single digits, all that fun stuff. And then wow. uh, something was missing. And I just sat and I, and I talked to my wife. My wife runs a, an entertainment company that she owns. And she's going to run hard for the next five or seven years. And I just said, listen, I'm not done. I, I love building teams. I want an opportunity. And so, you know, we framed together some of the things that I wanted for me to do it, right? I didn't want to do the Asia Europe stuff anymore. I was doing that a lot. I lived in Europe. I lived in Asia. So I wanted something that was domestic. I wanted a certain size. I wanted the right ownership, right. Uh, profitability, and something where the technology was really cool and really solid, and they were struggling in the go-to-market because the go-to-market is how I was raised. It's my, the fun part. While I'm a tech CEO, I'm not the technologist. I always have right. to have smarter people than me in the room. And this was one that kind of felt, I said no in February, I said no in March, and they kept talking to me. And, and I looked at it and I said, wow, it's, it's in the HR space. Same thing I came out of, right? Part of that digital transformation there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was right in my wheelhouse. So we decided to jump in and do it. So now I get to go to Orlando, Florida, uh, as well as where I live in California, New York City. But it's been fun. I love the team. It's a great group of folks. Um, with the focus coming out of COVID on wellness and financial wellness, the Ben Admin space is really hot. It's strategic. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's been fun. And what, what I thought I found is what I found. It's, it's really great technology. It's a good team. We got a little bit twisted on go to market and our partnerships and, and we're going to get that right back in track. And I'm really excited. You're also got a great funding partner with Vista. I've seen them work with companies in our space class. Just, just really, really, they've got a playbook. 
but they're also willing to deviate from the playbook if if it's warranted. Yeah, I'm I'm really impressed. I had the, I had the pleasure to meet Robert Smith last year in Boulder, actually at a Colorado game where he was in oh, wow. Prime and doing that stuff. And then when this came up, the one thing about Vista is they know how to build them, but they also know how to get a deal done at the end of the runway for everybody, so people are well taken care. Of. And I I just came out of, and they've been very active with me over the last three months. I just came out of, they run a a CXO summit every year where they bring in, you know, the CEO sponsors some of his C-level folks and you come in and there's a CEO track and then there's a track for your chief revenue officer, chief marketing officer. Dude, I got to tell you, I was really impressed. It's the first one. And I, I, for me, getting an opportunity new in to sit with my fellow CEOs, there was probably 50 of us there in a room with the board members from Vista talking about what's working, what's not working, how do we do it, what do we go? I was blown away and, uh, you know, it, it further reinforced the decision I made to jump back in because even though I've been doing this for a long time, I'm learning. And, and it was a great break for me and I actually got to reconnect with some folks that I've known through the years that I hadn't seen for a number of years. So, yeah, you're right. This is a great partner uh, and I'm excited to work with them. Let's, uh, so, Mike, let, let's um, before we jump backwards, let's, let's dig on that. You, you mentioned learning and having smarter people in the room. So before we go back and look at the career, per se, Talk about learning. How has that been foundational for you in, in your? Yeah, man. You know, for me, I'm never the smartest guy at the table if I'm doing it right. Yeah. Um, so, um, you, you just got to stay focused. My dad would say to me, this guy, simple guy, swung a hammer, great guy, raised raised five kids, wonderful family life. Didn't know what we didn't have, you know, lower blue, lower lower middle class, blue collar family. He said, listen, boy, when you get in a situation, keep your eyes and your ears open and your mouth shut until you get a foundation. And when you get the foundation, be decisive, but be humble enough to know that if you find new information that should change your decision, change it and do the right thing. Simple thing from a guy who ran a small construction company, but that's kind of been the foundation of how I built my career. You got to listen to, you know, my son's a, a great sales VP uh, and was a great sales rep. And, and I, my comment to him was, there's a reason why you got two ears and one mouth, kid, right? So just mm-hmm. listen first, because if you listen, they'll tell you where you want to go, where they want to go, and then you can go get it. And so for yeah. me, you know, the foundation element of listening and also making sure as an ex-athlete, the team concept that the team goes, you know, that's how you learn. And and I, I've been blessed early on in my career to have some great mentors, and, and I try to pay that forward with people that I continue to mentor today. So it comes down to, to, to listening is how you learn. Uh, and putting the work in. There's no shortcut. Well, that actually leads us back to, because you, well, pre-show, you were telling us uh, that you had some football opportunities uh, yeah. that you kind of worked he, through. He, he breezed through. He's like, yeah, it's some athletics. So let's ah, say that. Like, well, yeah. well, yeah. for, for those who aren't watching, we can describe your background. You've got yeah. helmets from every team, every NFL team behind Aut- you. Autographed. Autographed helmets. helmets. Different from just helmets, right? Yeah. I could buy yeah. a helmet. Yeah. I don't know if I get. Yeah. I don't know if I get Dan Marino to sign a helmet. That's Except a for that, bit. that one behind you with the star on it. Yeah, no, yeah. that, that yeah, one's good, but the one around. above but it. it yeah. That's Roger Stallback. Come He's on, okay. my Colgate Red Raiders here, though. That's the you know that's the one my <laughs> my wife put up and token for me. I'm a Colgate guy, so nice. are you really? Nice. Oh, one, yeah. of my, University. one of my dear yeah. friends went to Colgate, and uh, that's just a great school. I mean, and Fred Dunlop, who is the AD and head coach, is one of the finest men you ever meet. He's 95 years old today and still cooking and going to wow. the games. And he, he's, he was a great role model for me. Oh, I love that. Well, yeah. let's go backwards. Tell us the tell us the, kind of the high school journey sure. and yeah. uh, college, et cetera. Happy to do it. First and foremost, I need to qualify. These signed helmets, I didn't get them done. My wife's the host. She started at the NFL. <laughs> she's the she's the big wig. I'm just the plus one. I want to make that known out there fair, so all our fair. community doesn't think. <laughs> fair statement. Uh, fair statement. Listen, I, I went to a small high school in in uh, in um, just north of New York City, and and you know I I wanted to go to a small school because that's what I knew, and I wound up picking Colgate. Picking Colgate at the time, it was the smallest Division One A school in the country. Uh, and uh, had a great opportunity there. Uh, played for a great man, continued to grow. They did the big NCAA realignment there my junior year, so we went from the smallest 1A school to one of the better 1AA school. And in, in fact, right. my senior year, we were picked up by Sports Illustrated to be number one in the country in 1AA. And we didn't we didn't get it done. We lost to Western Carolina in the playoffs after being up 23-7 in the half. We kind of folded a little bit, so it was a disappointing oh. end, but... Mm-hmm. 
I, you know, I kept growing through my career and I was blessed to have an opportunity back then is when the USFL started. So I, um, I got drafted in the USFL by the generals mid year, my senior year, but I only had a few classes left. So I decided to stay and try to give the NFL a go and wound up signing as a free agent with the Buffalo bills uh, and made it to the 58 man cut and then got whacked there. So then that's the last, home. that's the last cut, right? Second to last. Second, second to last. last. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they brought in, they tra- they brought in a, an experienced guy from Seattle. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and they kept a lot of young backs, but got released. It was, it was, a, it was a good experience. Came home, um, and signed with the generals, which would be a January training camp and wound up having a great experience. I went back to my high school and I was the head JV coach and the, uh, O-line coach for the varsity and could train with the kids, could run with the kids. And it was fun for me because it kept me conditioning. And I think it was cool for them because there was a guy that went there mm. and played there that was trying to play at the next level. So it was, it was had a blast and then wound up going down to the generals where I was put on a practice squad and, uh, and spent the season there before that league folded. And it was, it was a great experience. I mean, I've never played a regular season down, played in a bunch of preseason games and I was marginal. Uh, and then thanks to my education at Colgate, when I, the USFL went away, I got a call from Gordon Watson, who was a Colgate alumni or a wall street guy. And he said, Hey, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, why don't you get an interview at IBM? I know some people there. They're looking for athletes and sales reps. And so this kid just happened to fall into an opportunity at IBM in 1986 or 87 when the tech world was just starting to boom. And, uh, and you know, I went from hardware to software. Uh, and I've been in the technology uh, career for the last, geez, 38 years, I guess. Something that it's back, 37 years. So I've been blessed. Fell right into it thanks to some mentors and some people. And then uh, thanks to the work ethic that my mom and dad put in me and just got got going, man. One after. Before we move on, I need to let you know about my friend Mark Pfeffer and his show, People Tech. If you're looking for the latest on product development, marketing, funding, big deals happening in talent acquisition, HR, HCM, that's the show you need to listen to. Go to the Work to Find Network, search up People Tech. Mark Pfeffer, you can find him anywhere. So this I feel is, like you. I feel like he's a, he's accomplished more in those, yeah, yeah, that yeah. four year span. Hundred percent. Than I have yeah. in yeah. forty six. Like, I'm, like, I'm, 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 I'm starting to look at my accomplishments differently yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, uh, man, listen, I never expected to have an opportunity at the NFL. I, I came from a small high school. Awesome. I just kept getting bigger and stronger, and, and played on a team where a great running back Richie Ehrenberg, who played the Steelers for four years, he won the kind of one double A Heisman. And I was a left tackle, and we ran that counter tray play the Redskins did where the guard kicks out and the tackle turns upfield, and I just happened yep. to be leading Richie upfield a bunch and then was blessed to, to play on a good team yeah, and a yeah. good community, and, and I, got a, I got a shot. And a lot of people say that you know, I'm grateful for the shot. It was, it was hard. It was disappointing yeah. when you're, right. you're there, and then all of a sudden you're not, right? So yeah. I probably wasn't the happiest guy when that happened, but, but uh, I just wasn't good enough. Right. How how, well, does, how how does that hit when you when you're when you're cut from that fifth? I mean, obviously you're excited, right, to get to that fifty-eight man roster, and then you get cut. How did yeah. I mean? How did that? How does that? Feel? I mean, I I would feel like that's pretty bad feeling. Worst feeling in the world. You're walking in, and this was not a normal cut time. It was like midweek, and we were going to play the Bears, I think, in the who the new dome in Indianapolis, right? For, brand new mm-hmm. at the time, right. Bruce Nichols was the assistant GM at the Bills, a good guy. The guy that signed me and brought me in and said, hey, Mike, uh, he wants to see you bring your playbook. You know, that's <laughs> terrible. Oh, right. that's, that's, <laughs> bring see, like, bring your playbook. <laughs> could, you bring a, could you bring a box with it? Well, yeah, yeah, great. I think, yeah. I think I said, Bruce, what, what the, you know, yeah, maybe yeah. they're adding yeah, plays for get you. A yeah. and, and they brought in an experienced guy, and they were going with a lot of young, skilled position. And right. Look, I, mm-hmm. I, I just, I, you know, I was, I just wasn't, wasn't good enough. You know, yeah, I, right. I tried, gave it a go. Um, uh, was blessed to be there. The only regret I have is that a bunch of the boys came to see me and they want to take some pictures. I said, no pictures until I see if I make the team. And, and I didn't make the team. And I wish I had some of those pictures today, not just for me, but for my kids and my grandkids to see. I mean, right. they see the contracts right. and stuff, but I, you know, you get, you get, you, you get tunnel vision and you're like, oh, yeah. don't jinx it. And, and I should have just let it be with what it yeah. was, but I was too wired at the time. Well, you put it into work. What's, what's fascinating to me about athletes and, and successful people in business is again that concept of teamwork 
the concept of, you know, there's no shortcuts here. Uh, you want to get bigger. In fact, mm-hmm. I remember when Henry, my, my oldest, he came in my office one day and said, Dad, I want to get bigger. I'm like, oh, that's easy. He goes, really? I said, oh, absolutely. You got to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> got to eat right, go to the gym, gym and stay with it. it. Yeah. yeah, you just got to be consistent. You got to go, you got, it's ours, you know, it's all those things that you just mentioned, but you got to go do it. If you go do it, you get bigger. And he did. So, yeah. like, but you put in the work, you know, that, that, you know, you got bigger, but, you know, again, you don't get just bigger overnight. It's, it's a process. Yeah. So, how has some of the things that you learned from sports, how has it, how have you pulled, th- how have you pulled that through in your career? Oh my God, it's, it's defined my career. I think the people that have worked very through the years roll their eyes. I use so many sports analogies, but, but, but the big, the biggest, you know, the biggest thing for me is, you know, the best CEOs that I've ever met have built the best teams. Right. Period. And somebody right. just asked me this question. It's not, I'm not the best CEO in the world, I'm sure. And I'm not the smartest guy, but I try to put people around me that compliment me. I compliment them and they can excel at what they do. And I think football teaches you that. There, I don't think there's any better sport in the game. You've got 11 guys on the field. you got to have each other's backs. And if one out of the 11 doesn't do their role, you fail. All 11 fail. And I think that's the analogy that I keep bringing to my team. When they get territorial or they're worried mm-hmm. about who has this, it's like, who cares? Yeah. And, and that's what we're doing right now at Plant Source. We're building the team. And because they were without a CEO for a while, we've made some changes. People are picking up a lot of stuff, right? They're right. carrying some things for us as we go. And the exact, I just hired a great chief revenue officer. We're going to bring in a new CFO. We're doing, a, we're doing a bunch of stuff here. And I keep telling them, don't worry. When we get the team in, we're going to sit at the table and we're going to see who's got bandwidth and who doesn't. We're going to split everything up. Nothing is predetermined right now. If you think you have to own this and own that, you're on the wrong team. And, right. and the analogy yeah. that I've using for them is some days you're going to be the bullpen catcher. Some days you're going to be the starting pitcher. But what I want is people who want to be on a winning team. One thing I'll guarantee you is we're going to make this a winning team. And if you can take that role because you want the championship ring, no matter what role you play in at the end of the day, then you're the right man or woman to be on this one with me. And I, you know, it's been, it's been good. That and transparency, right? In football, you got to be straight up. You got to be honest. You got to know where your strengths and weaknesses are and you got to prepare. And it's it, one of the things that I do when I interview people, which is pretty fun. I've, I've been using the same question for years and and it's listen do you love winning more than you hate losing or do you hate losing more than you love winning and and i like it because there's no right or wrong answer i have a little bit of a bias on what i think but but men women doesn't matter salespeople executives that's something that resonates with people and for me what i'm looking for is i think if you're the right person and you go about it in sports and business you prepare to win you, you pick your battles, and you prepare to win. And if you prepare to win, then you should really hate losing. <laughs> and that's me. You, number one, you learn more from your losses than you do from your wins. But for me, you know, if I pick the opportunity and I prepare and I don't execute, that bothers me more than anything else. I love winning, and we'll celebrate winning all you want. But I think if you, if you prepare to win and you hate to lose, uh, I think it gives you a little bit of an edge, and I think it really helped my career. So do you... Let me but, Ryan, just real quick yeah. question: Do you do you view competition? A lot of a lot of folks in our our world they view competition as other software companies, and I've had this bit for years, and I've told them that competition is not other software companies by and large. It's the status quo. It's them doing things the same way that they've been doing them. Like, yeah, it's easy to look like in plan source cases. It's easy to look at another software company that does similar things and then point to them and go, we're going to beat them. However, uh, I, I feel, and you know, please tear this apart, by the way. Uh, I feel like that's a waste of, uh, of intellect. It's more, how do we get, how do we convert the people from doing things the way they post it notes and Excel and all this other stuff? How do we get them to stop doing it that way and move to some modern you know, software? Uh, yeah, and that's I the think you're right. I think manual is your biggest competition out there, right? Which is what you're describing. Right. And if you focus your energy on what you're comp- – I mean, you want to be educated on your competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But more importantly than that is you want to excel at what you're doing. And, and when you come in a new situation, like I'm in at Plant Source, my comment to the team in the company meetings is don't, don't think about what you're doing and what you need to do. 
Think about what you're doing that you shouldn't be doing anymore. That's the hardest thing. It's easy to determine, hey, we got to do these things to the product. We got to do these things to support, to make our business better and have a great reputation in the market. But, but, but if you just keep adding, you're going to choke, right? Because, because the most expensive thing we have going on here is headcount and we just can't keep adding headcount. Can't keep adding headcount. Got to provide a return to our owners. That's part of a private equity owned company, right? So, so that is don't, don't say what you need to do. First off, assess it. What can you eliminate? If you're doing this report, You've been doing it for five years and it takes you a half a day a week to do it. Don't do it for a week and see if anybody complains. If they don't complain, don't do it anymore. <laughs> and, and we joke about it, right? <laughs> but that is true. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, so trying to get the folks to think about what are you doing that's going to have a positive yeah. impact? And what are you doing that really doesn't matter in today's world? Just You've just been doing it forever and eliminate that because it'll give you the bandwidth and the energy to go focus on something new that can really have an impact. Yep, sure. Yeah. So, Mike, two two things there. One is, so my original question was going to be, how do how do you break apart? How do you unpack a loss, right? So, so you want to win, but you hate losing. How do you reflect on that? And then the second question, which we can answer now or later, it doesn't matter, is how how do you understand or how do you look at what you're doing and know what you shouldn't be doing? So, breaking apart a loss is is. Uh... <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everyone? Ryan Leary here from Work Defined. You know, if there was one thing that I could change about recruiting, it would probably be the amazingly awful candidate experience that job seekers have to endure at one of the most stressful times in their life. Hiring teams, it is time to step up. You've got to create an experience that is memorable, fast, and efficient. And you can do that with Indeed Smart Sourcing. Check them out online at Indeed.com or just Google Indeed Smart Sourcing. Hey, this is William Tinka, Work to Fun. Hey, listen, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Inside the C-Suite, the podcast. It's a look into the journey of how one goes from high school, college, whatever, all the way to the C-Suite, all the ups and downs, failures, successes, all that stuff. Give it a listen. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. It's an art form, right? Yeah, it really is. Right. First and foremost, you want to have enough of a relationship to with the organization that you lost to where you can go back to them and do a loss review with them. Right. Hey, wh where didn't we execute? Where did we right. misread the situation? What didn't we cover? Right. Could, would you work with us? You know, we put a lot of effort in this. Can you tell us what we didn't do or where our product is missing something that our competitors have so we can learn going forward. And I tell you what, 90 percent of the market thinks that's really cool and respects it and, and will give you the time of day if you put the effort in to do it. Once you get that information, then you look at internal, right? Was it in our ICP? Was this an ideal customer profile opportunity? Should we have been competing for this business? And I think where you, where you have trouble is when companies are struggling a little bit to hit their goals, they may run after stuff that they really shouldn't run after. 100%. So the discipline and the effort, when you do the loss review, did we have the discipline and the effort? to go after the right opportunity? Did we have the right team at the opportunity? Did we listen and execute to what they really wanted in the opportunity? Did we put our best foot forward? How was our correspondence with them? Well, you know, all the things you want to do to, and I've, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to run companies in this side, 100 to 200 million size companies, 700 to 1,000 people. And typically you're competing against much bigger companies. At, at Workforce, when we won UPS, probably the largest workforce managing the deal. We were a 700 person company competing against 40, 50,000 employee companies. So you really need to be sharp and you need to position yourself so that you're bigger than people think in the market. Right. Ride on the shoulder of giants, ride on your partner's shoulders with, with the big integrators so that this great solution gets out there. So when you look at that loss is, did we leverage our partners? Did we leverage the executive relationships we have? Did we leverage our board who may have inside relationships? All the things you want to do, so you're doing this 360-degree look, and you're running the best selling process you can to give yourself the best chance to win. Will you always win? No. But if you pick the opportunity right, and you put the right team on it, and you do your homework, you should win 50, 60% of the time in this business. It's, and if you can do that, that's higher than industry standards, and then oh, you yeah, build a winning culture and a winning team. It's 25% is the industry yeah. norm. Yeah. It's uh, one in four. Uh, Win-loss analysis is humbling. Uh, it's a humbling process. 
Uh, because you know no you doubt. make the call and you say, "Hey, listen, I'm not trying. We're not. We're not selling you anything." And we no. watch, and then it's just you and me, and candid. Nothing's being recorded. I just have to know. Yeah. I have to know because I have to figure out how to fix it. And I had a client one time tell me it was a pretty large deal, and she goes, "Y'all were the front runner. You were going to win the deal. It was. It was basically y'all. That was it." And I said, well, well, what happened? What did we do wrong? Like, what just, I mean, it's okay. So it's not personal. We're, we're here now. She's like, your sales, uh, your sales leader, just like every time we would be with him, he would curse. And, and, oh, you know, audience. yeah. And, and, you know, like, it's okay. Like occasionally this, that, and the other, like, that's okay. But like, he was an overcusser and you just turned off the executives. That's EQ, not IQ. That's true. Right. No situational awareness, right? That's, that's gotta right. You got to listen and know your audience. And, and that's the big thing that's going on these days. And for loss reviews, it's hard, particularly because, you know, salespeople have egos, right? They, we, oh, yeah. we all do, right? That, you're out what... there, you're competing. When you start zero every month, you yeah. got to have something driving you, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and to hear something like that means situationally unaware. Bang. Biggest fault to a salesperson today. If they don't forget the IQ, if they don't have the EQ, where they yeah. can read the audience and know who they're dealing with, they're not going to succeed no matter how smart they are. Really big. That was humbling. And what was your second question, Brian? What was the second question? The, oh, I forget. Sec- oh, what was the second question? Second question. I, I wrote it down, but I can't read it. Validated. <laughs> uh, well, Mike, that, you're supposed to doctor, remember this stuff. <laughs> Come on, fire back at it. Well, if you oh. remember, when you run the tape later, remember it. Let yeah. me know. I'll, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, we'll run it back and let you know. So how but, long were you at I? Ready to launch a career and future you can be proud of? Welcome to Merrill, where an industry-leading advisor training program will help you get licensed. And with lead gen support from Bank of America's vast customer base, you'll get the referrals you need to establish your own practice. It's time to see your career charge forward with Merrill. Apply now at careers.bankofamerica.com. Copyright 2024, Bank of America Corporation. Yeah. My first five years, it was an amazing, uh, 590 Madison Avenue in New York City. I sold Whoa. new business. Um, wow. Amazing training program. It was a full yeah. year. They sent you away for a month to the Atlanta training facility. Then you're back in the field, then to Dallas. And it was, there were no PowerPoint then. You were doing flip charts oh, and all, yeah. the, oh, all yeah. the curmudgeon old IBM yeah. execs were putting you through the steps of the selling process. And, you know, why are you asking me about golf? Can't you see I have a fish on the, on the board behind me? I, no fish. It's all, you know. <laughs> So they would catch you, and, and it was an uh, amazing experience. I, I was a back-to-back Eagle Award winner, which was um, top new business salespeople in the country. I won it two years in a row with the group, which was exciting. And for me, it was funny because you know I grew up in a blue-collar family, and a lot of the IBM guys were legacy IBM people, white-collar. Right. And I, I remember it vividly. It was August, and they were they had two reps that were next to me were bitching that they had to go hop on the subway and it was hot and boom, boom, boom. boom. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, in August, I, I'm usually in a ditch with dirt under my fingers, digging in my dad's jobs or carrying block yeah. or carrying sheetrock, sweating my butt off. And I'm like, I, I can do this. I'm cool with this. And and again, it goes back to the, the, you know, having great parents that teach you chores are part of life and, you, you know, you build a great work ethic. And so it, it, IBM was absolutely a tremendous experience. And it's something that today's generations miss out on because companies can't afford to do that. And, I mean, they probably spent a half a million dollars on me on training 40 years ago, right? right. 35 years ago. And, and, and that's what I see in some of the younger generations coming through that when they start the new job, they want their promotion. want to know what the next job is before we go to execute. And companies today at Pace are doing are not doing that kind of training. They're not investing like they were back then. And so I feel bad for that generation, but there's a lot more tools online that people can do that I couldn't do. Back then. But it was the best sales and marketing foundation, integrity, sell with character, be professional uh, that I could have ever asked for. And, and spent five years there. And back then, the hardware curve was doing this. The mm-hmm. software curve was starting to do that. As an yep. IBM salesperson, you, you sold with your partners. I sold with a company called J.D. Edwards back then. That yeah, was on the AS400. And I jumped yep. out and, and went to J.D. Edwards. and. Interesting story there. You'll love this. And when I uh, sat down with my dad to tell him I was leaving IBM, and remember, we grew up north of New York City. My dad did a lot of small mm-hmm. renovations and things for a bunch of the IBM execs, quite frankly, that lived in the wow. area. He looked at me and he just said, wait a minute, at IBM, you, you have How a would job you leave? for life. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? And I said, because the software curve is going. He goes, what does that mean? He said, well, 
put it this way, Tom. I'm going to make more than my boss's boss's boss in my first year at this software company if I get my job done. And he said, well, good luck. Let me know what I can do to help. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so, you know, I had yeah. kids really young. So it was me. I had a, my son and daughter before I was 25. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I and as a blue collar family, what you give your kids is coming for you. Right. So I was out right. there on a mission to go make it. Uh, and it was, it was just the best training in the world and the best foundation and the best move I ever made was jumping into software after that fight. Were you there for the, uh, acquisition, the Oracle acquisition Were you at JD Edwards during that period? No, no. Yeah. You had already left. left before that. Yeah. I already Got left it. and moved on to other opportunities. Just there. Yeah. 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 I what had, did, I, well, you know, I, what was I, after found, I remembered the question. Oh, well, ah, well, it, the word. it took a little bit, but I got it. I got it back. It was, how do you look at what you're doing overall mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. know what to get rid of? Yeah, that's probably one of the hardest things in the business world is what not yeah. to do, right? right? It's a struggle. I think first off, you have to be intellectually honest with yourself on what you're capable of doing and not capable of doing, right? Mm-hmm. Number one. Which and is then difficult. You have to, oh. Yeah, self-reflection is probably one of the hardest things, right? Because, you know, you're either too hard on yourself or not hard enough on yourself. It's very hard to have, it's very tough to have the medium. And then, and then it's, it's almost, for me, it's trial by error. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to do this meeting this week with the team. Well, let me see, let me see what I hear from them, right? Are we doing it just because we're doing it? Right. Uh, and then actually assessing, um, writing down, what am I going to do this week? And, and, if I don't get it done, what's the impact? Is it really an impact? Or am I just going through the motions on some of this stuff? And I think just constantly reassessing you know, the things that I'm doing in line with the priorities of the business, the role that I have, how I'm being measured, all those types of things. Right? And it, it's, it's just continuous iteration. It really is. It's nonstop. And um, you're never totally right and you're never totally wrong. Um, but for me, it's been trial by error. If I, if I don't do it, is anybody bitching at me? Uh, and if, and if I do do it, is it having the impact that I want it to do? And so I think in transforming a company, right, this is the third or fourth one that I've come in and done it. Um, it, that's, that is more difficult. You can set the strategy, you can build the rallying cry, you can do all those things, but it's, what can we stop doing to free up the bandwidth so that we yeah. can really redirect them on these things? And that, that's, that's the toughest part of this job, I think. Do you see AI or Gen AI stepping in and helping with some of Absolutely. that? Yeah, absolutely. And some of the things that are repeatable, yeah. that are foundational. Uh, and, and look, if you're a Vista company, with, I just came out of that conference, the AI, Gen AI is a big thing. What can we do to help support our customers better? What can we help do to help manage our pipeline better? All the things that um, we can take bodies away from and redirect them to more interactive areas where they have to be interactive. And some of the rote things can start to be done for us and inform us and create that knowledge base that could be responded to and all those types of things. Um, any enterprise software company that's going to be worth its salt is going to have some type of Gen AI helping drive efficiencies, um, not just in the product, but also in the building of the product. We're doing it with our engineering organization, and 60% of our engineers are offshore in an entity we own in India, and 40% are onshore here. Um, and we're seeing a 15 to 20% improvement in coding with rolling Gen AI into it. And that, that's huge for us, right? Oh, yeah. Huge. So we're real, and, and it's in the infancy, infancy. So we're really excited about it. Look, you got to be careful. Do I see any pure Gen AI business apps that are doing it all on it? No, uh, I don't see that yet. Uh, um, but I do see it being a complement and a driver of efficiency and acceleration in certain areas of the business. So let's, uh, uh, we'll just kind of stay on this topic for a moment because uh, I want to ask a question here. We have a lot of conversations. William and I have a lot of conversations with people around. AI, Gen AI replacing right the workforce, right? We we don't believe that, obviously, right? And most of the world doesn't believe that. Clearly, you don't because you've already said that. But for the 18-year-old who's graduating high school and going in the in the college now, and their parents are walking through that journey with them, what do they need to know? What do they need to learn? What what are the mm-hmm. majors they need to consider? Because it's different from when you came up. As it is to, I was, today. I was a petroleum geologist major at a liberal arts school. So, yeah, I was going to be a land man. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't uh, even know, you know, that, I don't even know what great, that does. <laughs> that's a great question. I, I got to get ready for that for my guiding my grandkids, right, that are seven, yeah. six, and five and three months now. Um, wow. I'm a believer in a liberal arts education. 
Me too. I'm a believer mm-hmm. that you you want to touch a lot of different things because my belief is that 18 years old, you don't really know what you want to do. There's very yeah. few of you that know yeah. what yeah. they want to do that are that focused, right? There are the exceptions. Don't get me wrong. I got but one. But I think if, if, yeah, if you're forced to sample, something will click. So right. I like that, number one. I do think anybody that's not doing uh, some type of education on technology and the future technology is going to be left behind. But I think today's kids are so technology driven that they're all, they all want to do mm-hmm. something to do with it. So I, I would, um, I would, I, I think, uh, I, I think the Ted Lasso line when he's playing darts is the best thing I've ever seen, which is be curious, not judgmental. And I think mm-hmm. if the kids can go into it and not judge what they should be, shouldn't do, should or shouldn't be doing day one, or what other people doing that they don't think is right. And just right. be curious to why are they doing it? And should I explore that? And could that click? I think curiosity is the key for the young kids coming in today. Because what I can tell you right now is going to change in five years, maybe, maybe two percent. years, right? Yeah. So, but if you, if you remain non judgmental and you remain continuously curious, you'll be out there experiencing what's going on and something's going to click that you're going to want to run out. That's how I would mentor my kids. You know, my nieces and nephews, all that stuff. It's stay open-minded, explore. Yeah. It's not a life or death decision if you change your major. Not give at it all. a go, yeah. give it a try, and then just change if you don't like it. Yeah. Maybe a little extra work, but if you really don't like it, don't fake. Right. That that was a little self-serving because I've got, I know William's got one already gone. I've got one looking at colleges now. So I'm going to use this episode here, this segment, and I'm going to show it to her. <laughs> yeah, sure. thank you. That's very. Yeah. That's the highest, yeah. highest form of compliment. Yeah, I appreciate you. that. I mean, look, arts. I got no silver bullets. It's one man's opinion, but that's what I've seen. Liberal arts and the humanities. It's for me. I have an art history degree as an undergrad. It teaches you criticism, teaches you critical thought, it teaches you the ability to ask questions. Right. Which I believe right now, so much of AI, you just got to understand how to ask questions. And figure out what you want as the output. And I I think that's where some of the hard sciences folks are struggling a bit is is they don't have that skill. They have other skills. They have massive other skills, but they don't have that skill. Listen, and and that's coming from a guy. I'm a numbers guy. I'm a math and science. Look, I'm I'm a twin. Uh, I have a twin sister. And oh, she cool. got all the creative and art <laughs> capabilities. She speaks the languages. She plays multiple instruments. She's an art therapist. Yeah. And, and I'm a capitalist, right? So this yeah. is coming from a guy that's a, that's a math guy who's yeah. saying to you, you have to be curious and, and spreading it out and experiencing different things. I mean, one of my buddies is, was an English major, and he's one of the best salespeople in the world that's ever happened. He's an English major. Oh, right. That's what he focused on. I remain in college. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, he's a top level sales exec for, for years and a wildly successful career. So you just don't know. So just be curious. I love that. I love that. What uh what did you do after JD Edwards, real quick? Oh my god, you date me. I went to a couple other companies. <laughs> the one that's most relevant probably is Advent Software. Yeah. Where we took them public in nineteen ninety seven. I got to work for Stephanie DeMarco, who was one of the original ladies of the valley out yep. there when Silicon Valley was building. And that's pr- everybody has something to look back on and say, ouch or ouch. That's mine. Cause I, I left at the time I was commuting a lot to San Francisco. My then wife didn't really want to consider moving there because all family back East. And so I left Advent before I should have, because um, it was really a cool experience and we did well. We took it public and yeah, paid yeah. for my house and did all that kind of fun stuff in 97. Um, but I would have liked, cause the culture there was so good and the people were so cool and it was like the, before DE and I was big, they were DE and I big time, and it was really broad, um, and it was a great experience. That's a, that's an amazing company, and it's so funny. One of the kids we hired, Peter Hess, as a as a telesales guy, wound up going on to be the CEO of it. So so it was nice to yeah. see that transition. So I went from Advent to SS and C, and you know, uh, which was a competitor, didn't like the culture there, and moved on. And uh, then I had a great run at at OutlookSoft, which was a Hyperion Solutions competitor funded by. Uh, the old Pequot Capital and, yep. and uh, GE Equity, where I was a president, and we sold that to SAP in 2007. And I had the privilege to work for Mr. McDermott, Bill McDermott at uh, oh my God. SAP yeah. for two years. Uh, and it's great. We're on a chain with a bunch of guys that are ex-Bill disciples that are all CEOs. And Bill was mm. came in, said, listen, here's what we want you to do. 
I said, Bill, I don't know if I'm a big company guy. He said, do it with me for two years. If you don't like it, you'll move on. And and I did you know I didn't want to be at a big company. He gave me an opportunity to uh, run my group. Um, I got to live in Singapore for him because we did an acquisition of business objects that was struggling in Asia. And he said, would you go run it out of Singapore? And I got to live in Asia for two years or almost two years. Learned a ton from him. He is a consummate sales executive. Uh, and I learned a ton and, and we left on great terms. And the fact where I actually went back for a little while to help them with the cloud uh, and then left again, uh, you know, to go do other things. And so, yeah, I, I've been blessed, man. I've, I've had so many. There's a guy named Larry McTavish who passed away a few years ago. He was one of my amazing mentors. I've had so many guys and gals in, in the business world that would take time that, that I try to do that as well. Um, and get time with. So a workforce, I have a last question for me. How'd you get yeah. pulled into the HR tech work tech space? Like workforce, yeah. Um, how'd that happen? It was inter- it was interesting. Um, I, I I was introduced to Peter Soboloff and Ryan Hinkle at Insight Partners. Great Insight's a great private equity firm. Yeah. Um, and uh, Workforce was competing to be the reseller solution for SAP against Kronos at the time. Yeah. And Kronos was the ten thousand pound gorilla. Yeah. And they won. They won, but they were having a hard time getting contract done and so uh, insight said hey you know we want to hire you to I said, you need to hire me you, you know we want you to take a look and help the founder on you know what can we do to get this thing over the end line get it started and jump started so i spent some time with him kevin Chosky at the time and and mm-hmm. uh, got it going and of course the next was you know we're going to replace the founder and he knows it and would you consider and we're talking to this other sap exec who you know and and so uh they they, they got me into a four-year deal it was supposed to be a four-year deal <laughs> um, but we found some challenges in the, in the beginning with some with some uh, technology stuff that we had to do. So we recapitalized the business after four years. So the team that we built was able to take a little bit of money off the table. They they were very generously re-upped everybody, uh, and we took it from this mom and pop shop to where, you know, we won Procter and Gamble and Ford and Stellantis, and we won Microsoft when we were a Oracle hosted company. So when you win Microsoft and you're on Oracle Cloud. You that's know, you, you, you know, you have a great differentiated solution. And that's what it was. The founder, they built a product that was differentiated yep. with this amazing engine. And it let us go into the most complex situations uh, and succeed. And, you know, our tipping point there really was when we, I brought in the new chief technology officer, who's now the COO, Nicole Newmarker. She got it organized. She got us offshore. She got it scaled. We re- and, and now it's the, I think it's the top workforce management and scheduling solution in the market today. And, and by the wins that they're doing, they're demonstrating that it continues to I, be. I did a briefing with Kevin and Howard Turnoff, or Turnoff, a uh, hundred years ago at HR Tech. And I believe, were they based in Detroit at the time? Livonia, Michigan, my man. Livonia, Livonia. Michigan. Yes. Wow. That Halfway is crazy. Halfway between Ann Arbor and the Detroit airport. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> I, got to, I got the pleasure of going to, instead of Orlando, I was going to Livonia. Oh, it's, it's funny. Summer, fun. Summertime, that's great. Winter, <laughs> not so much. It's funny. When I ran Aria and I was doing kids and they got me apartments, apartment in San Francisco, an apartment in Miami. And when I took a uh, uh, workforce, I was with my wife at the time. And I said, should we? And she goes, no, I'm not going to be going to <laughs> Lavonia. You're, like, You're good. Just stay at the Marriott. And- <laughs> <laughs> uh, hard to go from uh, Southern Cal in New York City to Livonia, but uh, not, nothing against my friends in Livonia. I love you folks. No, no. A great experience and a great team. But yeah, we like the water. We want to be on one coast or the other. Right. Ocean, I should say, because there's plenty of beautiful lakes in Michigan. But you yeah. can only swim in them a month a year, though. It's so cold up there. If, yeah. if that. Yeah. Yeah. No, stay stay on the stay on the coast. Mike, one, one final question uh, for me. Throughout the career, you've had a lot of people work for you. Right. And you've mentioned a couple that have gone on to be CEOs, COOs, and you know, and done really well. How much mm-hmm. of your drive has been building other people around you to mm-hmm. flourish, let allow mm-hmm. them to flourish? It's a great question. I love it. I probably would be more wealthier than I am today if, if I if I wasn't so generous with the people who are with me <laughs> and made sure they were taken care of. <laughs> but look, I'm 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 fine. My wife and I live a glorious life. We're totally blessed. Yeah, it, it, it you know, when you're a team player. Mm-hmm. And and when you're the coach and as the CEO, you're the coach, you, you want nothing more than your people to succeed. And, and I would always give them all the accolades. I, accolades to me were when the company's doing well and we're paying out big bonuses and everybody's thriving and you got the NPS right. scores. And 
I was blessed to uh, comparably to get picked as one of the top CEOs. And that comes from my people that were given feedback. And I think the, the, the best testament for me was the folks that followed me from company to company. And, mm-hmm. and when you come in as a new CEO or a new leader, it's really important because they know your cadence. Sometimes after a meeting, you know, the guys that I brought into work first, would, would, when I would leave, they would say, this is what he, I know what he's telling you, but this is what he, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty clear, but, but when he says that, that means well, you better move quick. There's urgency to this thing. Yeah, get it going. And, 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 uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. Seeing those folks succeed, seeing, you know, Jeff, who was my number two at workforce, take the number one seat and I moved to the board. And then have a successful exit with ADP, which was announced this morning for him. I think it was a great learning experience for him. He did a great job. He's very gracious to me and thanking me for the support I've given him. Those things mean the world to you, you know, if you're a team player. And, uh, you know, that's I had so many guys take the time and give me time growing up to teach me. Because, you know, I was young in this world with kids right away, and, and I had to go get it. And I ran hard to go get it. And, and I'm blessed that it all paid off because I got surrounded by really good people. Jobs, Mike walks off stage you guys are the best thanks for giving me the forum it was fun to talk to y'all mike thank you so much for your time know how busy you are we appreciate it happy to do it guys 